thanks, Ali, for your too kind uh, introduction. Um, yes, like Ali said, my paper touches on many of the things that were said during this conference, so I hope I won't be too repetitive. And there's an especially strong connection, like Ali also said, with, uh, with uh, Tara Yoris and Peter's talks. Um, and uh, as you'll see, I think, I lean more towards Tara and Yoris' talk than to Peter's, but uh, there's room for discussion, of course. Uh, in this paper, I'll argue that in the digital age, with its abundance of information, one of the most important roles of the scholarly editor is that of the guide. In this paper, I will argue that in the digital age, with it, uh, I'm sorry, uh, so, someone who, um, who can help the user grasp the full complexity of the materials the digital uh, scholarly edition has to offer, like this guy. A similar case was already made uh, in the year 2000 by um, my current supervisor, Mats Dahlström, in a paper titled Drowning by Versions, where uh, he argued that a digital scholarly edition is intended to fulfill two perhaps contradictory user demands. The clear economical selective guiding through the textual mass in such a way that the user can benefit from the editor's insights and competent judgment, and the broadest possible presentation, on the other hand, of the textual material, enabling the user to choose different paths and variants than has the editor. So on the one hand, there's the aim to present the user with the editorial aspects, um, uh, while um, uh, with, a, with a complete archive of te uh, textual documentary evidence, here B, uh, and on the other hand, there's uh, the impulse of already uh, providing a first educated interpretation of those materials, what Mats has labeled A. Matt suggested that in general, print editions focus more on the editorial aspects, A, while digital editions focus more on archival aspects, B. Print editions tend to bury rivaling var variants deep in the critical apparatus, uh, while digital editions tend to bury the user in a seemingly endless collection of documents. This is partly due to the medium, of course. Print medium is text-oriented, linear, and has limited amount of space that forces the editor to be concise, while the digital medium is more visual, multidimensional, and uh, virtually eliminates any spatial con concerns. We can show all these beautiful documents in their full glory and high resolution, so why wouldn't we? This was written almost 17 years ago, but I think it's still spot on for better or for worse, and I know this is a divided issue at this symposium, um, even. Uh, the share of uh, documentary edition, okay, yes. <clears throat> the share of documentary editions has grown exponentially in these last two decades. Thankfully, I think we've also become better in trying to reconcile these two aims in, uh, the, in our digital editions since then. When Mats suggested a possible solution for this problem, for allowing the two objectives to exist side by side, he recalled a well-known scene in classical mythology. Portraying the archive of documents uh, in a digital scholarly edition as a textual labyrinth, he encourages the editor to act like a contemporary Ariadne, offering a number of distinct threads that can lead the user through the maze without getting lost. An apt metaphor, I think, that already calls the attention to the importance of the editor to incorporate some sort of guiding principle into the edition to help the user find its, her way. Still, as editors, I don't think any of us like to see of our, uh, to regard our editions as labyrinths. The implication here is that uh, as a textual labyrinth, the edition would be overly complex and incredibly difficult to navigate. A bit like what uh, Federico showed us earlier today with a screen capture of someone navigating through uh, the Confessio. During my work as part of uh, the, digital, uh, the Beckett Digital Manuscript Project, another ma metaphor suggested itself. Perhaps it's better to look at the edition and its relation to the user and the, ed and the editor in terms of Dante's Divine Comedy. Sorry, that was a labyrinth. <clears throat> So Dante's Divine Comedy. 
At the start of the poem's first canto, Dante is scared out of his wits as he finds himself lost in the wild, in a wild, seemingly uh, impenetrable forest with no way back. After dwelling aimlessly in the woods for a while, a faint voice reaches him in the dark. It's Virgil who comes to Dante's rescue, guiding him through the forest and further still, and all the way while pointing out the many wonders that are hidden underneath. If um, intertextual references are any indication, this must have been Beckett's favorite scene from the Divine Comedy. As Dirk van Hulde has pointed out, allusions to this third set, and especially its last line, Ci per lungo silenzio parea fioco, recurred time and time again throughout Beckett's works and notebooks. This line suggests that because Virgil had been silent for so long, for centuries, that when he finally started speaking again to attract Dante's attention, his voice was hoarse or faint, fioco. A source of inspiration for Beckett, maybe it could also help us uh, develop uh, the genetic edition of his works uh, further. Unlike Theseus, however, Dante didn't have an Ariadne to prepare him for his journey. Instead, Dante ventured into the woods absent-mindedly and unprepared, so it's no wonder that he got lost so easily. Perhaps getting lost, though, is not necessarily a bad thing. For an editor, the greatest compliment she can receive, I think, is probably when the user is so entranced by the curated documents that she loses herself in the materials completely. As editors, we shouldn't be afraid to give up control and um, let our users roam free. It's their edition as much as it's ours, and you never know when a serendipitous discovery, like these mystical animals that Dante encounters before uh, meeting Virgil, will lead to an unexpected breakthrough or a new hypothesis about the edition's materials. At the same time, it's important that at the moment when the user feels lost, she can rely on the editor's expertise to let her know where she is and to lead the way to where she wants to go. Because on a computer, unlike a labyrinth or enchanted woods, if things get too difficult, the easiest way out is just to close the application and be done with it. Uh, a scenario that the editor, I think, will try to avoid at all costs. Instead, the edition should draw the user further in and encourage her to accept the editor's guidance and trust uh, her expertise. While this Dantesque simile may seem like wishful thinking, I still think it can be a useful metaphor to keep in mind while developing and designing digital scholarly editions. If grabbing the user's attention can al already form a considerable challenge in itself, holding it, I think, is a much more difficult <coughs> task still. If we want to allow for this kind of fruitful interaction between the user and the edition, I think the editor will need to walk on a thin line between being absent on the one hand and too present on the other. Like Virgil, the editor needs to be silent long enough to allow the user to be fully immersed in the edition, but eloquent enough to persuade the user to keep going uh, when help is needed. To achieve this, the editor's voice has to be faint, fioco, to appear in front of the user's eyes only when that user herself uh, finds herself out of her depth. And I would argue that this is exactly where the edition's interface comes into play. So this interface, is it the editor's best friend or her worst enemy? Over these two days, I think we've heard arguments for both positions. And the most staunch defender of the second position was probably P Peter Robinson's earlier today. Already in 2003, in a paper called Where We Are uh, with Scholarly Editions and Where We Want to Be, another paper that I believe in many ways is still very relevant today, Peter implored editors to put their data on the internet in a manner that allows, uh, and that allows it to be appropriated by others, augmented, corrected, infinitely reshaped. In this respect, um, it can be more useful uh, to offer an API for the edition than to design a single fixed interface around the materials because it makes it easier for the programmers and developers to reuse the edition's data uh, and indeed, it's important to keep in mind that while the, uh, while the interface allows the user to interact with the data through the tools that it offers, it also inevitably limits the interaction to, to a certain extent through the tools that it doesn't. But this approach is uh, strongly targeted to a specific type of user, 
the meta user, if you will. Sorry. Um, the meta user is a user who wants to use the addition's raw data for their own research and to query it in new, unforeseen ways. For these users, the addition's interface will often act as a barrier rather than as a gateway between the user and the data. But these are not the addition's only users and perhaps not even the addition's primary users. If a digital scholarly edition can be interpreted as an argument about the materials it encompasses, like Tara and Yoris suggested earlier today, then the primary target our audience for the edition will be the scholars the edition is trying to persuade. This means that the users the edition will try to cater for first are not meta users, such as developers or programmers, but rather advanced users textual scholars or other scholars who already have some degree of familiarity with the material or with similar materials. These users are ex especially interested in learning more about the content of links between, uh, between the edition's individual content, uh, documents and about the implications of the editor's interpretation of those materials for our broader understanding of the text. For those users, uh, who will not necessarily know how to deal with the raw data or an API, the interface will be a friend rather than an enemy, a means of interacting with the materials and of assessing the ed editor's interpretation of those materials. This is what makes design, web design, such an important aspect of the digital scholarly editing process. The interface is the first thing that the user will notice and it will determine the way in which she will read the rest of the edition, at, if at all. <clears throat> that's why the edition will ideal, ideally need an interface that's both attractive and intuitive. Attractive because it needs to draw the user in and intuitive because it needs to facilitate rather than hinder the user's reading experience. At the same time, it's important to keep in mind that while making these design decisions, the editor is already steering the user's interpretation of the, uh, of the edition's contents to some extent. This is exactly what uh, Tara and Joris were saying this morning. In this respect, the interface can be regarded uh, as a second layer of editor editorial interpretation. After offering the interpretation of the ed edition's documents by transcribing them first in XML or whatever, the editor offers the user an interpretation of the transcriptions when she decides how to present them. Nevertheless, it can be argued that the visualization itself is at least as important for conveying the editor's interpretation as uh, the transcription on which it's based. Uh, as, the main, uh, as the main text the average non-TEI proficient user will come into contact with, the interface displays the edited text that will determine the way in which the user will read and interpret the edition's documents. And the same goes for the edition's navigation, layout, and its selection of tools. In a way, we can regard the interface as a digital scholarly edition's new paratext. Not exactly part of the edited text itself, maybe. It still has an undeniable impact on the way the user reads and understands the edition. This makes the interface an important place for the, edit for the editor to convey her views on the material. That's enough theory for the moment. Let's look at how the Beckett Digital Manuscript Project has tried to put these concerns into practice. Yesterday, the Beckett Project was already introduced by Adon and Ellie. Um, and the concept of genetic editing, they introduced as well, and afterwards elaborated on by Joshua and Hans. As a genetic edition, the Beckett Project shares many of the difficulties with their uh, with uh, Joshua and Hans's Wolf and Joyce editions. Focusing on the writing process of our author's works, we're especially looking for ways to visualize the variation that occurs between different documents and versions. Paths that were taken and paths that were rejected. Draft versions in no notebooks, but also marginal notes in books in the author's personal library. They're all equally important because they are all part of the creative process. The greatest, greatest challenge here is to analyze how all these materials relate to each other and to convey this to the reader in the form of a convincing argument, be, be it in a traditional printed way or in the form of a guided user-computer interaction through the, computer's di uh, through the digital editions interface. About a year ago, 
in November uh, 2015. And the Beckett Digital Manuscript Project redesigned its interface together with the publication of its new module of Beckett's play, Crap's Last Tape. Uh, um, and this is what the edition used to look like. So this is the front page, and if you went into the edition and followed it to the text view, uh, it looked like this. Presenting the transcriptions in a linear, uh, this, this is a text view which presents the transcriptions in a linear text-oriented way with thumbnails in the, uh, of the manuscripts pages as points of reference. As you can see, there's a lot of menus here that have their own deep sub-menus that the editors use to guide the user to the many tools and features that the edition has to offer. And on the right, there's a series of quick links of what the, the editors thought were the most useful tools to make them more easily accessible to the user. This is a good example, I think, of how simple things like navigation can be used uh, by the editor to guide the user through the edition and through their interpretation of the materials and of what they think are the most interesting aspects of those materials. But it's not exactly a good example of Virgin's faint Virgil's faint voice. It's rather shouty. There's too much clutter, too much redundancy. The interface doesn't say, look at all these interesting documents. It says, look at what you can do with these documents, or even what, look at what we, can, we let you do with these documents. In her paper, Testing Nines, Dana Wheels makes an interesting case that sometimes what editors think are the most attractive features of their edition can be a distraction for, to the reader features that keep the user from engaging with the materials in an efficient way. So he wanted to take a step back as editors and get out of the user's way by removing the clutter and visualizing only what's strictly necessary in a given context. So let's uh, visit the edition's new interface. This, yep. Um, so you can this is the home page where you can pick a module like um, this, uh, the edition of uh, The Unnameable, one of Beckett's works. You can select one of the drafts. This is the first draft. And, and then you can go to a thumb, a thumb, uh, through a thumbnail to the image view where you can see the image. And if you want to, uh, uh, be able to read the, the text a little more, you can use this zoom image function. So that's a lot better, isn't it? It's also French, so I'm cheating a bit. Um, if you want even more help, you can use image text, in which case you can select a zone in, in, the, in the document and see our transcription of, those, of that specific zone. Or if you're more interested in the text than in the documents, there's also the text view, which is similar to the one that I showed you earlier. Um, uh, where you can see that the, the quick links have disappeared and some menus uh, items have been removed or replaced by generic icons that uh, the user may be familiar with, like logging out or the search bar. <clears throat> the menu also stays visible as you scroll down, so you have relevant tools uh, you may want to use at your disposal, like um, the top layer that uh, adds all the additions and deletes all the deletions, so you can see the final state of the draft, or uh, uh, writing tools that displays the text it works, yes, in the, in, the, in the color of the writing tool that was used um, while Beckett was writing these texts. Or, and this is probably what we're the most proud of, you can click on compare sentences, visualize the number that we gave to each sentence in the corpus. And if you then click on one of, this, of these sentences, this brings you to a chronological overview of uh, all of the different versions of that specific uh, sentence. So you have uh, um, <clears throat> the, the different versions and the, the writing process of this specific sen uh, sentence throughout uh, the writing process at your disposal. 
And if you want to see uh, more clearly what, what the differences between these different versions are, you can compare them through Kool-Aid X, which is also what Tara uh, showed a small screenshot of uh, during the, her talk. And uh, you can see the variants in black and the invariants in uh, green. None of these views or tools that I showed you uh, are new in comparison to the old interface. They're just visualized a little differently. They're less distracting, I think, and they only start to appear and become more and more prominent as the user moves deeper and deeper into the edition and could argu arguably use more and more guidance. This guidance also becomes even more essential, I think, if we move to the BDMP's newest module called the Beckett Library. The Beckett Digital Library. This library offers scans of marginalia and other reading notes in books that Beckett owned, most of which are still preserved in his old apartment in Paris. This is a vast collection of books that the user can easily get lost in. So the editors have made some suggestions uh, and, uh, uh, to sort or select some of these books. If you click on a, um, for instance, you can click on uh, all reading traces and just see books that have um, reading traces in them, sorted by alphabetically by author. So you can go to one of the authors, like Kant, uh, with a book that has uh, reading traces in it, like here, where you can see that there's a vertical bar in the in the side in, in the in the margin. Uh, that Beckett uh, used to call, call the attention to this specific phrase. And you can also see in this case that this is actually a phrase that was later used in, um, uh, in Beckett's works. So he, he copied it into a notebook, and you can go there by clicking on the link. Sorry, this. Clicking on the link, yeah. And so you're taken out of the library and into uh, the in a, a nameable module again. And you can see here that where uh, Beckett copied this, this quote from the book that he owned. And you can uh, see a note there. And the note tells, uh, tells you that it's also been incorporated into the text itself. And you can go there by clicking on this link. And then you can see in the notebook in the text where, the note, uh, where this quote has been incorporated. And there are links uh, between all of these uh, uh, states that, uh, that can guide you back and forth um, from, the, from, the, from the library to the manuscripts or from the manuscripts to the library. Um, <clears throat> I think this comes close to what Mats was talking about when he called for editors to leave Ariadne's threads in their editions to guide their users through their materials. Traces of the editor's interpretation of the source materials um, that, the editors, uh, that the users can follow from one document to the next. Of course, this makes the editor very visible again, but that's okay because at this point, um, especially when you're going through Beckett's personal library to look for marginalia, they are, uh, the user is already engaged in the materials, at which point the editor tries to draw the user even further in still to engage not only with the documents, but also with the links between the documents, links that are based on the editor's interpretation as a genetic critic in this case, and that can be then assessed by the critical user in a very direct way by interacting with the data through the edition's interface. Um, as a final point that I would like to make, if I can, Ellie. Thank you, just a minute or two. Um, I, would, I would like to say that uh, as the editors of these um, digital editions, we're not just the developers of these interfaces, we are the users too. And so I was very happy to hear Joshua make a similar point in his response to Peter's talk this morning. In Dot's keynote yesterday, she reflected that wonderful t-shirt that she was wearing. Um, she referenced it, that uh, said data over interface. And I get that point completely. As a researcher, it's by analyzing the data, by extracting the relevant information from that data, that I do my research. 
Without this data, there are no additions, uh, be they digital or in print. But I also find that it's exactly by developing the interfaces and thinking about the ways of, about, about new ways of trying to present the data uh, and our interpretation of that data that we come to our best new insights about the materials we're studying. This is also one of the most interesting aspects of Stan's uh, keynote, keynote yesterday, I think. It's by reconfiguring our materials in new ways, by constructing an interface around those materials, and by interacting with other people and seeing how they interpret our interfaces what, and what they think is missing, that we, can develop, and that we can develop our interpretation of those materials too. That's also what I really liked about Richard's presentation when he said, you process your data, you visualize it, you learn from your visualization. The visualization of the interface uh, or the interface are not the endpoints of the research. They're just the beginning. We try to make a point, and when that point doesn't come across in the way that we wanted it to, we can reconfigure our presentation, or we can run with it and reconfigure our interpretation. If we're lucky, we can do both and make two arguments about our data instead of one. <coughs> A few years ago in Louvain, Edward van Houten uh, suggested that transcribing uh, our source materials in TIXML is an extreme form of close reading that almost always teaches us something, about, uh, something new about the sources that we're transcribing. And I agree with him completely. I would go so far as to extend this assertion to the development of the interface too. It's by developing this interface and playing with it, by finding ways to show the user uh, to show to the user or to ourselves what we want to say about the materials, that we learn more about those materials, adjust our interpretations, strengthen our, strengthen our arguments. I don't think we should underestimate the impact that the creative aspect of developing these interfaces around our data has on our growing understanding of those materials. So I'm sorry, Dot, but I think if I was forced to pick a side, my T-shirt would have to say interface over data. <laughs>